so uh, I go by Srini. It's a lot easier to pronounce. Uh, so this is uh, some recent work um, and some older work that we've been looking at over the last few years, um, specifically related to the problem of Markov clustering. But let me try to, at a high level, tell you about the problem we're focusing on here. We're focusing on graph clustering. It's a fundamental problem. Shows up in many walks of human endeavor, uh, ranging from pharmaceutical to biological networks, protein interaction networks, uh, to VLSI design, and of course, the social sciences. So given a graph, the goal uh, in layman terms is to discover groups of nodes that are strongly connected uh, to one another and yet weakly connected to the rest of the graph. Uh, what makes the problem hard? Uh, there are several uh, uh, reasons, and particularly several of them have shown up over the last couple of decades and so, uh, but some of them have existed for a while. Uh, so first, we are looking at increasingly larger and larger graphs uh, in these days, whether they come from high throughput experiments, whether they come from um, images, high resolution images, whether they come from uh, social networks, and so on and so forth. Second, a lot of these networks inherently are produced uh, in a very sort of, uh, in a fashion where there is a systemic noise to them. And so there are false positive interactions, there are false negative interactions, and so on. Uh, a number of them have interesting topological characteristics that traditional graph clustering algorithms have a very hard problem with. So if you have traditionally worked in the space of graph clustering, um, you know Kernigan's Kernigan and Lin approach, you know the Metis approach, those kind of approaches, status quo, if you apply to today's data sets or today's graphs, uh, they will have a hard time because of certain topological uh, characteristics. Um, there's also domain insights. So we've, the, the last couple of talks in this session talked about specific domain insights from biology, but there are domain insights from whichever uh, walk uh, these kind of graphs are generated from. And finally, there's dynamics, but I'm not going to talk about that uh, in today's talk. So there are a number of classic solutions to the graph clustering problem uh, that have existed. Um, some of the common ones in today's world include spectral methods uh, of the form of uh, Jambo Shi and uh, Jitendra Malik's work. Uh, there are edge-based agglomerative methods and variants thereof from the physics community. There are graph class k-means based approaches, uh, kernel k-means based approaches by Dylan and others. There's, of course, the venerable Metis algorithm by Carapas Kumar and others, uh, plus some recent um, variants from the theory community, including work by Lang, Rao, uh, Mahoney, and Leskovich. Uh, and what I'm going to talk about today is Mar Markov clustering. Uh, and of course, for each domain, there are a range of specialized approaches, including, I think, one of which was uh, referenced in the previous talk. So, I'll first introduce the algorithm and then describe uh, some enhancements to this. So this is what we're working with. Given a graph, we convert it to a column stochastic uh, matrix. Essentially, uh, the way this is done is to think about uh, the columns as transition probabilities uh, going out of a particular node. They sum up to one. They can be interpreted as a probability distribution. Okay? Uh, so an entry in a column is a, essentially a column. Each column can be interpreted as a flow or transitional probability vector. And similarly, the rows correspond to inflows to a particular node. So this is, I think we all understand how this is constructed. I'm going to call this the canonical matrix M subscript G in some of the later slides. So the idea behind Markov clustering is to repeatedly apply a certain number of, certain type of operation until you come to a matrix that is extremely sparse, order n, where n is the size of uh, the graph that you're working with. And to interpret that subsequent sparse matrix uh, as a clustering. So that's sort of high level what the algorithm uh, that Stein von Dongen came up with. Uh, he's a mathematician uh, who does a lot of work in bioinformatics these days. So the MCL algorithm proceeds as follows. You start with this canonical matrix, the MG, M subscript G, and then 
you operate on this matrix using three operations. Yes, Alessandro. So, so the starting matrix is this one. So, so it's, it can work on an unweighted graph. So what you see here is that 2 is connected to all the other nodes in the graph, including itself. So the transition probabilities, if you look at the column, yeah, okay? Yes, it can work with directed graphs, it can work with weighted graphs. Uh, when you apply it to weighted graphs, you have to make sure that you, yeah, I mean, if the weights carry some meaning in the domain, you can't just blindly convert it to probabilities. You have to pay attention to it a little bit. Certain cases, the transformations work naturally, other cases, they don't, okay? Uh, but I, I'd be happy to uh, clarify that uh, later. So there are three operations uh, uh, that this particular algorithm applies. The first operation is a matrix multiplication or a, uh, what we call an expansion operation. And if you think about it, if you ignore the other operations, if you keep repeatedly expanding, what you really get is uh, at the final end, you get something like, you, you essentially get a page rank vector. Okay? If, you, if you keep doing this, you get a series of page rank vectors that are all identical. Uh, but the, again, the, the second operation that is applied is um, you take each column and you take each entry of that column and take it to a certain power. We call this power R, okay? So assume R is 2, so we're squaring each entry in the column. So what does that do? It basically ensures that the cluster structure within the graph especially if there is cluster structure within the graph, it starts peaking, okay? And I have an image in the next slide that explains what this does a little more clearly. So essentially, it's an example of the rich getting richer, transition flows to richer nodes uh, get richer. So if you think about it, suppose your column had two entries, 0.8 and 0.2, you square that and then renormalize, okay? You get 0.64 and 0.04, you renormalize, the outflow into the node that was already at point eight would be higher, okay? Then you, after this point, if certain entries are below a threshold, you prune it out, okay? And so this is the strategy by which, these are the sequence of operations, okay, iteratively that are performed here, by which you get to that really sparse matrix that can then be interpreted as a clustering, okay? And so the idea is that if you have many nodes coming to the same sync node, then that represents a cluster. Is there a question back there? Okay. All right, so, so pictorially, this is what the algorithm tries to do. You start with the original graph. Um, as you expand and as you inflate, okay, you start seeing the cluster structure showing up very early. So we're going from left to right and then bottom row, okay? So you start with the original graph, which is over, over on the top left corner. You go to the top right, so you start seeing the cluster structure peaking, the rich get richer. And then subsequently through a, a sequence of operations of uh, expand, inflate, and prune, you get down to something that's extremely sparse on the bottom right, which can then be interpreted as a clustering. Okay, so this is pictorially how the algorithm works. Now, there are a couple of things to note about the original algorithm. First, it was designed um, to work on small scale, relatively small scale graphs. Uh, and, so, and it's been widely used. MCL, Markov clustering, has been widely used in the bioinformatics community in, in particular because of its noise tolerance property. Um, and the, there are, however, two major limitations with the algorithm. The first, that it tends to fragment cluster structure. And I'll explain why in a second. And there's a fix for that. And the second is it doesn't scale particularly well to very large graphs. And we have a couple of fixes, one which is specific to Markov clustering, the other which is more general purpose. Applies not just to Markov clustering, but pretty much any graph clustering algorithm. So when we looked at this problem, this was the problems were originally identified by a few researchers. Yeah. 
Oh, so, so the algorithm actually has very good noise tolerance properties. So it is able to uh, really deal with noisy graph data and uh, produce good clusters uh, as validated by biologists as well. It's widely used in the bioinformatics community. Uh, in fact, uh, Falutsas and Dipayan pointed out it would be great if this could work in the context of social graphs, but it doesn't scale well enough. And that was left as an open problem in their paper. Uh, that, that's what we are trying to... Uh, there are provable convergence guarantees uh, the, the, in, in terms of it's um, if your matrix after a certain number of iterations is close to approximating what's called a doubly idempotent matrix, then it's going to guarantee convergence within uh, um, a quadratic number of iterations. However, uh, in practice, it's much, much faster than that, the number of iterations to converge. Yes, and I will talk about that. Yeah, yeah. So uh, we we are we are going to talk about these these fixes. Okay. So first problem, as I pointed out, is that it tends to fragment cluster structure. Okay. Uh, and this is primarily due to overfitting, and very specifically in the MCL case, it's because it doesn't allow one to constrain how flows amongst tightly connected neighbors diverge. Okay, so if you think about the columns in the matrix that I was thinking about, they can all be interpreted as probability distributions. So we can use a standard approach, KL divergence, okay, which allows you to measure, uh, or a symmetrized version of that, which allows you to measure the difference between two distributions. So if we use that, then, um, and then with a little bit of uh, uh, linear algebraic mani uh, manipulation, you come up with a neat closed form solution, which is outlined in the equation at the bottom there. Okay, and there are some, we have some theorems that we've proved about uh, the quality of the result, and we also have empirical results to, to back that up, okay? So the change to the algorithm, the only change to the algorithm is we're just replacing that step, uh, which we called, um, which was previously called the expand step with the regularized step, okay? So in terms of, um, um, uh, it doesn't affect any of the other properties uh, of the original algorithm, and it actually improves the quality of the result. Sorry? M, uh, that just, uh, that's just sort of MATLAB notation for multiplying two matrices. No, and that was M times M. M star M, that's just multiplication. Star just represents uh, multiplication there. Okay, so that's the only change to the algorithm, okay? The second key idea was that by introducing this regularized operation, we are now able to admit a multi-level approach, which allows, really handles the scalability issue, okay? Previously with M star M, it was a bit difficult to introduce this because while the standard approach for multi-level, for scaling up graph clustering algorithms is to coarsen the graph down to a fine size and then refine it back up uh, progressively. Um, the problem with doing that with the expand operator is that there was no easy way to project the flows. But actually working with MG makes life a lot easier for us. There are some things we can prove about from a theoretical standpoint about how the quality uh, can be improved. This is an, while we designed this originally as an improvement to improve the scalability of the algorithm, it actually turned out it also helped improve the quality of the result because by coarsening the graph, you're actually getting more of a global picture of the community structure, which is quite useful uh, in certain problems. So, so that's the, those are the two very Markov clustering specific solutions and fixes. Uh, here's an example um, uh, from a qualitative standpoint about uh, how good the algorithm does uh, on a few protein interaction networks. Um, and, and in particular, um, I, the, the one I want you to note is the, the middle line. When you have a noisier network, uh, uh, the qualitative improvements are staggering. This is like a threefold improvement over the original algorithm. So quality is given by the domain, by the 
by the biologists who tell us what is the correct clustering structure for this group of nodes, this group of proteins. It's based from the gene ontology, based off of the gene ontology. It's, it's how well aligned you are with domain knowledge. Okay? We also have similar results for some of the standard uh, graph clustering, NCAT, uh, um, conductance, and so on, and the results are quite similar in terms of quality. Uh, and in terms of speed up, it's staggering, actually. Uh, so this allows us to address the question uh, that we had earlier. And also, if you want to understand the qualitative improvements uh, compared to uh, some of the existing approaches, uh, this actually brings us, um, so again, uh, this actually brings us much closer uh, and much better in, than many of these other algorithms without paying the expensive cost of a spectral clustering algorithm. Okay? So, so, so it's not only against MCL, but also against other uh, ideas that exist in the literature for these kind of problems. So the third approach is generic. Okay? It's not MCL specific. Uh, and we've evaluated this on a wide class of algorithms, not just limited to Markov clustering. Uh, but here in this talk, I will focus on the benefits in the context of Markov clustering. So the idea is, is simple. This is what we'd like to do with the third fix is, given a graph, can I compute a sparsified version of that graph okay, without doing any reweighting? So unlike Spielman, Tang, and, and the uh, other ideas from the theoretical literature, we don't want to do any reweighting. Okay? We just want to do it, and we want to do it very quickly, this pre-processing step. Essentially, one pass, at most two passes over the graph. So two, two passes over the list of edges in the graph. Uh, and what we'd like to be able to do, what I'm showing you here in this picture on the left, is the original graph with 30 nodes. On the right is the same 30 nodes okay, with the number of edges reduced up to 30% of the original graph. Okay? I, I don't remember the exact number of edges, but it's roughly in that space. But what, and, and then what I'm doing here is I'm automatically visualizing this using an algorithm called Prefuse developed by Jeff here and others. So what you see immediately is on the graph on the right, the community structure becomes apparent. So not only, so this will, this is an idea that is not only useful for scaling up graph clustering algorithms, it's also useful for interpreting uh, the results you get. So the approach is, is actually pretty straightforward. So the idea, the goal is we'd like to retain edges that are part of communities. We'd like to get rid of edges that lie across communities. Okay? So again, this is like a, a bit of a chicken and egg problem. I mean, that's what, that's, that's what you'd like to do, but it's a bit of a chicken and egg. So we need some weighting mechanism. We need to compute this weighting mechanism fast. So one of the simple ideas that we decided to look at here was to simply look at, for each edge, how many common neighbors do the nodes incident on that edge have, okay? with respect to the total number of neighbors that they have. So that is essentially the jacquard similarity of the adjacency set of those nodes. Now you can do the same thing not just for a one hop, like immediate neighbors, you can expand it out to two hop neighborhoods if that's something your domain requires you to do. Okay, so, but what I'm, the results I'm going to show you here take the simple approach. It's just looking at the one hop neighborhood of each of those nodes. So I can do this, and then I can apply a global approach, which basically says um, I want to just retain the top edges, the edges that have the highest similarity measure. And this is an idea that people in the community have looked at in variant forms. Okay? Um, Andrew, Ravi, and David had a paper on VLDB a few years ago looking at dense graph identification, which used a variant of this idea. Okay? Um, and, it, and the idea is that you want to focus on the densest. Their goal there was they wanted to focus on the densest communities, and it does a great job for those kind of problems. And indeed, for these, the toy example that I'm showing here, it does a great, this global sparsification approach does an excellent job for identifying the densest parts of the graphs, if that's what you want to do. Okay? Now, it turns out that if you're going to use this for biological analysis, the densest part of the graph is the part of the graph that 
biologists actually know a whole lot about already. Okay? So if you take patterns you discover using something like this to them, they'll usually come back to you and say, yeah, this is known, this is good, this is known, this is good, this is known. We want to find something new, interesting, and perhaps from more sparsely uh, located regions. So the alternative to that sparsification technique is something called local sparsification, where you compute the same similarity metric, but the decision on which edges you choose to keep is determined locally. So it's, it's, it's borrowing heavily from this oft-used paradigm of thinking globally but acting locally. So the idea is that for each node, you look at all the edges incident on that node, and you have a relative rank ordering of those edges. And you retain the top d to the, suppose the degree of that node is d subscript i, you retain the top d to the power e, uh, where e is an exponent between 0 and 1 of those edges. Okay? And that's it. That's the idea. And this is, it's, it's easy to see that this can be done uh, very quickly, assuming you can compute the similarity metric fast enough. And for that, we can actually, and, and it turns out that it does a pretty good job of ensuring representation of cluster structure of varying densities. Okay? And that was something that we wanted to. It also has another benefit of retaining some sort of connectivity structure, which I'm not going to talk about in this talk, but that's something that shows up in some of the results. Now, the one question, the one caveat is, how can we compute the similarity computation efficiently? We can rely on uh, the idea of using minwise independent permutation hashing that Broder, Mitzen, Masher, and several others uh, have come up with. So, so essentially, what we have with local sparsification is an algorithm that can compute a sparser edge set, same number of nodes, no change to the number of nodes, but a sparser edge set that retains the cluster structure of the original graph. Once you have this, you can take any graph clustering algorithm and apply it on, on this. Uh, now, with, with using this with uh, Markov clustering, which is what I'm going to focus on here. What we saw is for the two data set, for two of the three data sets here, um, we see that with a certain sparsification ratio, you can get a, a significant speed up over the multi-level version itself. Okay? And also from a qualitative standpoint, there is a, there is a marginal benefit. The reason for the qualitative benefit is you are in essentially as part of the sparsification process, you're also getting rid of some of the noisy edges. Okay? And we have detailed uh, theory as well as empirical results for this. There's another nice feature to this algorithm. The other nice feature to this algorithm, and especially when compared to something like a global sparsification approach, is what I have here on the y-axis is eigenvalues in increasing order of the graph Laplacian. Okay? And eigenvectors, again, are sorted by from lowest to highest. The multiplicity of zero as an eigenvalue in the graph Laplacian corresponds to the number of components in the graph. As I said before, one of the problems with global sparsification is that you end up with, you end up with seeing a disconnected multiple components showing up, whereas with local sparsification, you avoid that. The other interesting trend here is that while this area under this curve is proportional to the number of edges, when you go from an original graph to a reduced graph, while the area under the curve is, uh, is proportional to the number of edges, we have reduced the number of edges, so the area of our curve is going to be lower, but it matches quite nicely with the spectral properties of the original. So there is something theoretical here uh, that it's taken us a few years, but we finally have some resolution to this problem uh, that we, should, we hope to shortly uh, publish. So last few minutes, what I'd like to talk about here um, is, so we talked about three key ideas, but now what I'd like to do is, again, to phrase it in terms of the context of this workshop, what we are interested in seeing how some of these algorithms apply to the context of emergency response yeah, and flood map. So again, um, we are part of a, a, a large project um, in the US 
looking at crisis informatics, uh, the key pervasive idea underpinning this project is coupling social sensing with physical sensing and modeling in order to do a better job of responding to natural hazards. In particular, our focus is on hurricanes and flooding. Okay? Um, and the goal, the overall objectives of this project is how to combine different modalities uh, in a meaningful way, accounting for noise, scale, and helping out on the ground emergency response personnel for planning and relief prioritization purposes post-disaster. In this context, the part that I'm going to focus on is using some of these ideas for image segmentation, in particular for flood mapping. There are other problems that uh, show up that are quite, uh, re that, are quite in that have some relation to some of the other talks we've heard uh, uh, in this workshop already. Uh, so there are a number of methods that are used from the remote sensing uh, space. There's a method called Otsu thresholding. There's also a watershed uh, transform algorithm, which is a semi-supervised algorithm. Spectral methods are used. And then here, we're, I'm going to present some early results we have using Markov clustering and a supervised version of Markov clustering that uses some stitching of segments we find based on human guidance. Okay? So in the interest of time, I can't really go into each of these methods, but this is an example of a satellite image produced by Sentinel. Sentinel. Uh, and in particular, we're focusing here on the floods that impacted Chennai uh, last December. And oftentimes, on social media, you have information about specific flooding and images from Google and so on, WhatsApp, where you have information about specific areas that have been extensively impacted by this flooding. So this is the kind of supervision we hope to rely on. The results I have here are hand supervised by humans. But what we'd like to get to eventually is to automate that process through some of these social media postings. So some of the geo-based approaches. So this is what the segmentation image, the problem looks like. And this is a hard problem for traditional image segmentation algorithms. Because it's not readily apparent where, where so you can see some of the major flooding zones, but not all of them. And this is between two of the depressions that, hit imp that impacted Chennai. There were three in total. So the watershed algorithm, which is a state-of-the-art approach in remote sensing, produces something like this. And it relies on human-induced landmass land that are provided that allows it to stitch the segments together. It gets the major water bodies, but doesn't do a very good job of capturing the river that you see running across, the two rivers. This is what uh, the spectral method, a state-of-the-art uh, approach, uh, gives you. Um, again, it does a reasonable job of getting the big water bodies, but it tends to fragment some of these segments. This is what uh, our original multi-level Markov clustering algorithm does. It does a pretty good job, but again, it's not able to get that riverbed quite neatly. With a little bit of supervision, right now this is being crowdsourced, but eventually we want to automate this process through social media posting. We actually do a fantastic job in terms of being able to identify the zones that are impacted. And not only that, what we can do is study these images over time to understand how the flood is receding, how it starts, how it expands, and how it recedes. Um, this is a particularly hard image because of cloud cover. It does a pretty reasonable job in this case as well. So to conclude, I talked about Markov clustering. I introduced the idea proposed by Stein von Dongen. I then talked about three fixes to some of the problems observed by individuals uh, in the community. Fix number one, related to a regularization procedure. Fix number two, again specific to Markov clustering, looked at uh, the problem of uh, a multi-level approach, which relied indirectly on our regularization approach. And fix number three is a generalized approach for sparsifying graphs. Uh, and we're particularly excited about fix number three because we have I, I think we have the final uh, fix for the theoretical arguments for why the algorithm works as well as it does. Uh, there has been some theoretical work on this approach. Uh, I think Sheshadri and uh, Roughgarden had a paper a couple of years ago 
uh, that provided some insight as to why this works, but I think the results we have now are, are stronger in terms of connecting it to the spectral properties I showed you. And finally, we are using some of these ideas for a real-world problem related to emergency response. With that, I thank you. Oh, I do want to take a minute and acknowledge uh, this is through a bunch of wonderful students over the years that I've had who helped put some of these results together. So all of them uh, uh, played an immense role in this uh, work. I'm happy to take any questions. So in some applications, uh, it might be useful to use high order relations among vertices. So this is the case, for example, in computer vision. Uh -huh. uh, and so, and so the problem there becomes one of finding groups in hypergraphs. So I was wondering whether these ideas can be uh, used for hypergraph clustering yes. as well? Yes. Uh, in fact, a colleague of mine, uh, uh, Umit Shatal Yurak, has taken some of our initial ideas on regular graphs and has implemented them on hypergraphs. And it's, uh, there's also, not just him, but uh, David Bader from Georgia Tech has done some work on this, as well as Henning, uh, I'm sorry, I can't pronounce his last name, long German name, but uh, Henning has done uh, some work in this space as well. So yes, yeah, I, I'd be happy to send you the follow-up links to that. Uh, it, so what we can provide, uh, the theoretical guarantees uh, that I was talking about at the end was about how, why the local sparsification algorithm works as well as it does in terms of maintaining or retaining most of the spectra without doing any of the uh, reweighting that's required by an effective resistance-based approach of the style of Spielman, Srivastava, Teng and others. Uh, what um, uh, we are able to show is that we, the, the reason why it does as well as it does without having to do all that ray weighting. No. Well,